This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 193 was recorded on November 14th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, which happens to be my favorite podcast when it comes to quant and rules-based investing. Nomura Securities Head of Cross-Asset Macro Strategy, Charlie McElligot returns as this week's feature interview guest. Charlie and I will start with the high-level macro picture, then drill down on the details of everything from equities to how Nomura's CTA predictive model works to why VIX futures are back to record short speculative open interest to what's next for gold. And be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when Patrick and I will take a deeper dive into all of the subjects in our market wrap with the benefit of one of Patrick's famous chart books. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, let's uh, start off with that S&P 500, which has been uh, incredibly range-bound right at this 3,100 level on the S&P. And I'm sure we're going to get Charlie to give us insights on the gamma situation on, at the, around those strikes. But what's your take on the markets here? What's next? I think that the melt-up wants to proceed higher. You know, when you get to round number resistance, as we're seeing here at 3,100, you always see several days of kind of, you know, trying to struggle to get through it. And then usually when you do get through it, there's a pretty quick move to the upside. Charlie sees a different scenario, though, and I think it's much more tactical. It's not that he doesn't see this melt-up continuing through the end of the year. But in the next few weeks, I think Charlie's going to be looking for some kind of pullback to occur. If you want to play the melt-up, up, maybe that pullback, if it happens, is a buy the dip opportunity. But let's save the rest of that for the feature interview with Charlie McElliott. All right. Well, let's move on to that U.S. dollar index, which overall has not been doing that bad. It's been down a little bit today, but we've seen the dollars recovering over the last week or so from uh, its worst levels. Do you think uh, this is a turnaround point for the dollar? Well, we've stayed above 98 all week on the dollar index, at least on the December futures contract, just barely above 98 as we're speaking on Thursday afternoon. All indications are that the recovery is still in motion. But, you know, this was the easy part. We got down to a little bit of an oversold condition. There had to be at least some kind of a bounce. The question is, is that a bounce that's going to take us to a new cycle high, let's say 99.50? or higher? Or are we going to just partially retrace and then move to a new lower low, perhaps confirming that outlook that a whole bunch of people seem to have, thinking that the early October high point was the high for the dollar? I'm still leaning on the side that there's new cycle highs still to come for the dollar, but uh, I'm, I'm opening my mind more and more to that other viewpoint. There's certainly a lot of very smart people who I have a lot of respect for who see it that way. So uh, I think the jury's out, but let's see what happens. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil, which has been incredibly range bound for the last week or two. What's your thinking on oil and how did the inventory numbers come in? Well, as I said in the last week's episode, Patrick, there's been a persistent bid for WTI crude oil. Uh, I've noticed this. Uh, several other traders on Twitter have noticed this. Something I just noticed in the last week is th this bid really seems to have a U.S. regular trading hour bias. In other words, it, it feels like almost every morning, you know, Europe has sold crude oil down to its key support level. The chart looks like it's about to fall off a cliff. People wake up in North America and start buying. And by the time we get to noon, we're back up to our range resistance level, which has been for the last uh, couple of weeks now, the 200-day moving average. And I, I got a count on my chart here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, today was the ninth attempt to break through that 200-day moving average. 
And uh, we did get through it before inventory. We were trying to break higher. It felt like that persistent bid just wanted to take the market higher. But then we got to inventory. Crude oil, now API, the private service, had set expectations around a small drawdown on crude oil inventory. But EIA reported a build of 2.2 million barrels. Cushing, Oklahoma, was a drawdown of 1.2 million barrels. A lot of people saying, okay, that means that streak of builds in Cushing is all over now. I really think that is a bad misinterpretation of the data. You have to keep in mind that a spill on the Keystone pipeline shut it down for almost two weeks, about 10 days. And that took 4 million barrels out of Cushing last week during this reporting period. So that drawdown of 1.2 million barrels, if not for the pipeline situation, would have been a massive build of 2.8 million barrels. And hey, the pipeline is back online now. Now it's operating at reduced capacity with reduced pressure, which is their standard operating procedure. But eventually it'll be back up to full pressure. And it seems like that string of Cushing builds is likely set to resume as we get into next week's reporting period when we have the benefit of the pipeline being back on. Meanwhile, gasoline building 1.9 million barrels, distill it's drawing down 2.5 million barrels. So overall, it was a build. Cushing was a drawdown, but uh, again, uh, there's special circumstances that define that. Meanwhile, even more bearish data, U.S. production ticking up not just one tick, but two ticks to a new all-time record of 128 million barrels. And that's despite the fact that the rig count has been declining in recent weeks. Imports 5.7 million barrels, exports 2.6 million barrels. Tape action, fascinating to me. I many times have said on this program, it's not so much the inventory data, but the market's reaction to it that I pay the most attention to. Obviously, with that very, very bearish inventory report, we had to see downward tape action. We were down 1% to about 57 spot 15 in the first 10 seconds after the data came out. But you know, Patrick, we rallied back up and spent several minutes again trying to push through that 57 spot 46, which is the 200-day moving average, and you didn't manage to get through it, stayed below it. But, you know, the, the bulls, even in the face of a very bearish inventory report, were still trying to see if they could find a way to take the market higher. And we've seen that several times in the last couple of weeks, and it does seem like whoever's doing all this buying seems to be in a North American time zone. So it's been very fascinating to watch. As we speak on Thursday afternoon, We have drifted back down below the short-term moving averages to about 56 spot 82, just about a dollar below the high of the day, which was just before the inventory data came out. Uh, I expect that we are going to get back down to the 13-day moving average, which is where we've seen support, maybe back down to the 100-day moving average at about $56, which is where we've seen stronger support. But, you know, I won't be surprised if we see another repeat of this pattern where Europe takes us down in the morning and and the U.S. takes us back up, and by noontime, we're pushing on that 200-day moving average. Will the 11th time be a charm? We'll see what happens. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to gold because last week we saw, obviously, that all those lows at 1480 taken out, and we traded down to 1450. And uh, we're seeing gold bouncing a little bit in the last few days. What's next in for gold in your mind? Well, I took advantage of that and bought a little bit down there just above 1450, although not very much. The number I really like is around 1420. That's where you get to a number of key technical levels kind of converging. One of them is the 61.8 Fibonacci retrace of the move up from the breakout zone to whatever the the top was. So I'll be buying in in much larger size if we get down to 1420. But I'm starting to think that might take a little while because 1465 was an important support level on the way down. As you say, we broke through it. It looked like we were headed lower. Well, just in the last day or two, we've pretty impressively rallied back above. You know, normally you break down below a support level, it becomes resistance in the other direction. Uh, We saw a little bit of resistance in the other direction coming back up, but not much. 
And we're back up as we're speaking now to about 1472, a good seven dollars above that 1465, what should have been a, a new resistance level that had served before as support. And I think probably what's driving this strength in gold is that it's starting to feel like that backup on treasury rates has perhaps run its course and that treasury yields are going to head lower. And of course, lower real interest rates mean higher gold prices. So I think that's giving gold a boost here. All right. Well, let's move on to the 10-year treasury yields, which uh, have backed off. I mean, it looked like we were about to test 2% and we're back here towards 180 on the yield. What's next? Well, it feels to me like this correction in yields is maybe over. But, you know, Charlie McElligot knows this fixed income market a zillion times better than I do. So I'm going to defer to his greater wisdom. He's going to have plenty to say in the feature interview coming up next. This week's featured interview guest is Nomura's Charlie McElligot. Why did we invite Charlie back this week? Well, Charlie has been both incredibly popular and very widely requested by our listeners. It's been several months since we had him back on, but particularly, he's been really good at calling some of these big trends and where the reversal points have been in these trends in fixed income markets. And the question that was on my mind before we even booked Charlie is, okay, we're clearly seeing a backup in interest rates, you know. Is it a, a change in direction or is it just a correction? I was leaning much more toward just a correction, but how much of a correction is still to come? Is it over yet? And I thought Charlie would be a particularly good guest for that subject. As we'll get into in this interview, I think Charlie thinks that it is over and that we're headed back down toward lower yields. Certainly what we've seen in the last few days seems to be consistent with that. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. I did a full-length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson, the host of this excellent podcast, back on September 7th, 2019. The download link is in your research roundup email. We discussed a number of key issues about the value of having a rules-based investment strategy in a portfolio. In our conversation, Niels shared some insights that may surprise you, especially when it comes to how trend-following strategies don't really operate the way some market commentators suggest they do. For more information, including a free book about trend-following and the accredited investor slide deck from my interview with Niels Kastrup Larson, go to toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro slides. Check them out. You'll be glad you did. Eric's interview with Charlie is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Charlie McElligot, head of U.S. cross-asset macro strategy for Nomura. Charlie, it's great to have you back on the program. Listeners, we do have a small chart deck that Charlie prepared that will accompany this interview. You'll find the download link in your research roundup email. Charlie, I want to start with the really big, broad stroke, big picture, and then we'll get into some of the details that you've been writing about in some of your daily notes. When I first interviewed you more than a year ago, you were talking about late cycle dynamics, the end of the economic cycle. And I don't think you got anything wrong. I think you were spot on. But now we are more than a year later, and I think we are seeing that the economic cycle really is ending. But boy, the stock market's just got this persistent bid. What is going on here? And uh, is it telling us that the late cycle analysis was wrong? Or is it just that the dynamics have changed and the market can melt up no matter what the economy is doing? It's a pleasure to be back. And I, I appreciate the conversation as always. Um, look, you know, I think that initial conversation, you know, sometime a year ago, a little over a year ago, was and remains still very consistent with what we're seeing now, which was that at the time, I think people were really, you know, this is probably closer to last summer, people were still very much believing in this idea that, look, we were late cycle, well, we were above trend growth, above trend inflation, we had just, you know, we were just so many months into the actual fiscal stimulus. And, you know, at that point, a slowdown or recession seemed, you know, was very unlikely, I would say, for most people's uh, 
beliefs, but there was a lot of consternation with regards to what was happening with the shape of the uh, yield curve. And at that time, we were seeing this powerful flattening. And our that message, I think, when on one of our first um, podcasts a, a year to a year and a half ago, was it's actually the signal with regards to the actual recession is the steepening of the curve, right? The flattening happens when the market, you know, sees this kind of slowdown building, sees financial conditions tightening. The steepening begins to happen once the market begins to price in Fed easing, right? The front end moves lower. And then ultimately, you hope that the long end moves higher in conjunction with that under this kind of, you know, this the easing of financial conditions and the stimulus added from the Fed. The idea was that typically, traditionally, per, you know, kind of backtest and analogs, that you see curves steepen in those final moments before the recession. And that's the actual signal there. And as that relates, say, back to equities, it's really a thematic. It's less about directional equities at that time. It's more about the thematic change. Typically, a flat curve is associated with slow growth, low inflation, or just kind of like a what I'd call this muddle through of, of the last you know umpteen years of what it feels like in the post-crisis period, which is this you know, 2% kind of ish, one and a half to 2% GDP growth, sub 2% core CPI, which has grown this very crowded kind of everything duration trade over the last few years, right? You're, you're, you're generally speaking, you're long the bond proxies, right? Which is everything from typical minimum volatility defensive sectors. And we see, you know, the way that utes and REITs and staples have uh, really been the best performing S&P sectors over the past year, in addition to the secular growth names like you know, the high-flying SaaS software types of names, the, the FANG tech type stuff, which actually acts like a bond because of valuation. It benefits from the lower yields, justify the expensive valuations, and they return, you know, they grow earnings. They grow as in this world of, of low yield and low growth. On the flip side, people have been short cyclicals. So that is a, a product of this kind of slowing growth, kind of grinding, muddling through world that we've come to expect. The thing that started happening last year was that the curve began to steepen because the market began sniffing the slowdown. And the market sniffs the slowdown, then you price in that Fed action. We got all that. You know, that steepener call that we made last year and then the catalyst for some of this momentum unwind that comes with that, you know, the momentum unwind of, of kind of trend trades has very much been kind of the theme of the, the past year. You know, these these very stark, sharp kind of shock down periods where kind of prior carry type trade, prior momentum trades really, really come unglued. Now we are at this point again where, you know, in the last two months specifically, where I've been talking about the implications of the bond market rally over the course of 2019, having overshot, right, that people were potentially misinterpreting that absolute level in interest rates as this kind of signal of imminent recession, when instead we were actually still kind of holding that model through. So my message over the last two months has been, look, if bonds unwind some of this overshoot rally, you know, you're really going to get another shock down because the market is underweight cyclicals, overweight the bond proxies, and um, underweight anything kind of growth related. And that, you know, has also been this very tactical story. And that's been that's been bang on too. So now I think everybody is trying to readjust for a world where they're starting to get rid of that probability of the now recession and now beginning to push it back into a 2020-2021 story. For the benefit of any new listeners, I want to call their attention to your earlier interviews, Charlie. Listeners, if you type Charlie's name into the search box at macrovoices.com, look for an interview that was titled Fear the Steepener. And there's a, a lot of really great content that was just as relevant right now today as when it was recorded several months ago. 
Let's come back to that theory again. As I look at the two tens chart now, as we're speaking, Charlie, we we got down to the point where the two tens actually went negative very briefly. Looks like a bottom, and you know it's bounced back to about where it had been trading for the first half of 2019, kind of muddling through there. Is that the the steepener that you said to fear, or are you talking about a much bigger steepener still to come that we need to fear? And where do you see this going and playing out from here? So, you know, the steeper that I was really focused on last year was, was 530s, just because I want to truly capture that, that long-term growth and in inflation view that only kind of the, the very duration-sensitive part of the curve, meaning the long end, captures. So the 530s was the place that I was, you know, really advocating a, a significant uh, steepening in, in the 530s cash curve from kind of last summer when I was pushing it ultimately ended up um, almost quadrupling. You kind of went from 20 bips to 80 bips, say from you know Q3 last year into um, summer of, of this year. That was that kind of first signal that, okay, market has adjusted. They smelled the slowdown, as I said. They're now pricing in Fed activity. Then we began to realize that things were not quite so bad as all of this permanent, almost um, you know, you know, constant recession talk that we've seen over the course of 2019 in these last two months. And with that, bonds have sold off, you know, and, and actually it was the front end that was sold. And thus you've had, you know, you had a little bit of a flattening here as the market began to price out so much Fed activity. So that is a, a big part of this where I think people went from, you know, one side of the boat to, oh, okay, fiscal stimulus, late cycle, already hot economy, up, up and away, you know, kind of this view at, at one point, you know, last year into this, oh my gosh, imminent recession. We went from one extreme to the other. And now I think we're being a little bit more adult here with regards to saying, look, the mid cycle adjustments undertaken by the Fed probably have extended this cycle because they've once again eased all of that financial conditions tightening that was at the core of the cross asset bouts of volatility that we saw all year in 2018, you know, specifically as it related to the balance sheet unwind on top of the Fed hikes. We've reversed some of that damage. Now I think people can be in a, in a little more pragmatic neutral spot that the world is not ending imminently. That said, these steepenings come before the recessions, before the recessions do tend to hit on that kind of six to, to nine month lag. So People are by no means capitulating on that view that the recession is an inevitability, that the business cycle is coming to an end. I think they're really more about kind of adjusting the positioning and the sizing of some of these trades, and certainly based on the, on the timing of those trades, where in their minds, it's, it's now been pushed off a year, probably because of that Fed liquidity injection. Now, in your daily note on Wednesday of this week, you wrote that the momentum reversal of the past few months was the easy trade. That was the, the easy one to see coming. But the hard part is where we are right now. What did you mean by that? Well, why is it the hard part and, and what is it that we should be looking at here? So, I mean, whether it was just kind of from speaking with clients that, that how crowded in a qualitative sense the narrative became with regard to this end of cycle skepticism and that, that the trade war had thus pushed kind of this already end of cycle slowdown view into an outright, you know, imminent recession view that that overshot. There was two big bond rallies over the course of, of 2019. The first was March where we had a, just a vapor move lower in treasury yields. And the most recent you know, power bond rally was in August. Both of those were very much convexity related in my mind, meaning mechanical buying. The March episode was due to big bank dealer desks that have been shorting options to clients for frankly the last two years who were buying these big crash recession hedges. And those trades were the curve cap trades that I started advocating last year on the podcast, which were basically bets on the curve going steeper and bets that the Fed was going to have to cut rates into, into a slowdown. Big banks had sold tons of these option structures to you know large clients from asset managers to family offices to hedge funds for the past two years and was just collecting premium and they were expiring worthless. It was a great trade. 
Well, in March, you had a really significant global growth scare, a slowdown scare. You started seeing some bad data come out of China, especially as it related to some of the rhetoric around the trade wars. And all of these dealers that were short these options, they were basically tied to you know low strike receivers, which were calls that treasuries were going to go higher, or short options that the curve was going to steepen, which were basically bets that the Fed was going to ease in the front end and the market was going to have to price in more Fed cuts in the front end. They just got lit on fire. So that was the first part of the rally, where it was very much just about dealers having to hedge these short options exposures. The most recent one in August was convexity hedging of another sort, which was really from the mortgage space. We had another large global growth scare over the course of, of August. In July, frankly, European data was absolute garbage. The Asian data was really accelerating worse. And um, you know, from there, you ended up having a situation where mortgages are inherently negatively convex. So as uh, bonds rally, mortgage, you know, those that play in the mortgage space, whether it's MBS accounts or bank portfolios or bank treasuries or mortgage REITs, which are heavily leveraged, you know, seven to 10 times type of entities, they had to go out and buy more and more TY, more 10-year future, to stay hedged the lower the yields went. So in both of those cases, the point I'm making is that it was a mechanical feature, not necessarily, though, a view of this imminent recession, and that was at risk of being misinterpreted. My whole point then over the last two months has been that, you know, specifically in August, there was this false optic that the world was ending. And all it took was a little bit of a less bad outcome on China trade, a little bit less bad data, something constructive to hang your hat on that was going to see the same mechanical rally have to reverse, especially as positioning had grown so extreme. So you were seeing, you know, whether it was bonds, whether it was kind of, you know, record buys in duration across treasury futures or euro dollar positioning in 95th percentile extremes to equities, where there also was this end of world, end of cycle slowdown trade that I just spoke about earlier, along the bond proxies, both secular growth and the defensive minval stuff, and your short your short cyclicals, which are you know the growthy stuff, the inflation stuff. You know we saw that with prime brokerage data, where you know tech was 99th percentile owned by hedge funds, and conversely, energy, financials, materials are kind of 10th percentile down to zeroth percentile, if that actually is a word, with regards to kind of historical ownership. So everybody had this trade on. It was very crowded. It was levered. We saw the, the hedge fund data show that funds had low net exposure, so they had a very low directional lean long by historic measures, but they had big grosses on because both sides of the trade from the long side, being long secular growth and long defensives, had worked so well, and they were very short, the cyclicals that kept going down every day over the course of the year. My point was in August that the moment that we get some positivity injected into this market, you're going to have a way outsized market response as we've overshot. And now this positioning would have to unwind and probably painfully so. And that was at the core of this cross-asset momentum reversal that we've seen. So in today's note, uh, Wednesday's note, you know, I, I spoke about that. Since the end of August, you had a 43 basis point cheapening in 10 years. You know, the zero coupon ETF is down 11% a cross-asset momentum strategy, quantitative strategy um, built by our QIS group down 14% since uh, that start of September. Uh, equities price momentum factor, you know, long the top decile of Russell 1000 performers versus short the bottom decile of Russell 1000 performers over the past one year, down 15% over that time. Value over growth, cyclicals over defensives, everything reversed. The hard part is now. We got the overshoot. We got the positioning cleanse. We've gotten the deleveraging in a lot of these positions. Now, this you know momentum too, this momentum unwind has passed. And now I think the whole world is set up for this yields higher, stocks higher trade into year end. You know, which is partially based on fear of missing out. You know, just the psychological nature of it. A very positive Q4 seasonality for S and P which is just a fact of nature for you know the past 90 years. And, uh, and then expectations, too, around this phase one China-U.S. deal signing. My concern now is that investors are, have potential to get caught flat-footed by 
another rally in the U.S. Treasuries, another rally in U.S. rates, just as everybody has now shifted to the other side of the boat and is now kind of short treasuries, short rates, and that stocks are susceptible because there's so much new fresh long added into this rally that we've seen off the back of some of of this China-U.S. trade deal positivity. I want to pick up on that point about stocks, because you did write about equities in your Wednesday note as well. And you reference your CTA model, and uh, I know that that's something you've gotten a huge amount of press attention for. We'll often see, you know, a piece on Zero Hedge that says, okay, Nomura's Charlie McElligot says the magic line in the sand on the S&P is blankety-blank number. If, If we get a daily close below that number, it's all over. I've had the opportunity to interview an expert on these CTA systems and how they work. And the information I'm getting, Charlie, is really, you know, maybe 30 years ago it worked that way, but the most sophisticated traders, the people who are running most of the money these days are the Rentex and the DE Shaws, these big quant shops that have incredibly sophisticated models that are reacting in real time. And from everything I understand, they really don't have any magic line in the sand that gets crossed. Their their models are, are processing data on a on a continuous basis. So help me understand exactly what your Nomura CTA position estimating model is. How does it work? What does it do? And, and help us reconcile how it works with this idea that I'm getting that, that you know, it seems like maybe the, the way these quant trading systems work is very real time. And it, it, it seems like it's hard to understand how there could be a magic line in the sand, so to speak. Sure. So, I mean, look, there, I think there's a couple of points here. One, one, I think, is simply the way that information is exchanged these days where a snapshot in time is then extrapolated or kind of passed around as, as you said, some sort of line in the sand, magical trigger that in actuality, in reality, is dealing with so many moving targets and moving inputs in this case, that those levels that we release on a daily basis, building this reverse engineering, this model with our QIS group are constantly moving. And they're constantly moving because of the volatility inputs to the various underlying instruments, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about a very complicated portfolio with four asset classes, five time horizons, 20 different strategies, where this aggregate portfolio and the volatility inputs and the price inputs and the fact that there's five different tenor windows, right? Short term being two weeks, one month, three months, and then longer term, six months, 12 months, and the loading of each of those there never is just a static point where we are buying and or selling. And that's, that's the first point that I would make. I mean, at, at the end of the day, yes, this is a, it's, it's incredibly complicated because you're dealing with five windows of a time series momentum construct. And the sizing is inversely proportional to the instrument's volatility, right? It's, it's pure risk control which is, you know, the way that CTAs manage their exposures and manage their risk. So, you know, that speaks to the fact that the number of inputs are incredibly complicated and that, you know, you can't have something that is snapshot in time at some level be anywhere close to telling the same story the next day. It's, it's a new slate almost on, on, on every day. The other point that I would actually make here, too, and this is almost more of a, a qualitative observation or a philosophical conversation point of uh, discussion, but I've felt this way for the longest time. I, mean, I view the world from the lens of volatility. You know, I think the most powerful and most meaningful flow in the market is, is gamma, which in some ways is saying that the tail wags the dog with regards to what people think moves markets actually does not move markets. And I, you know, I spend a lot of time working with our vol teams and, um, and we have a tremendous look under the hood with regards to what investors are doing and, and particularly what, you know, what dealer desks are doing with regards to hedging of their risks. And this is very important because I think the CTA is such a hot topic, not simply because that we're talking about this actual universe, right, where Barclay Hedge estimates that the actual size of the AUM and they update this monthly on, on their website via reporting CTAs into them of $360 billion. And it's clearly one of the most heavily leveraged strategies out there and, You know, on, on top of that, which matters because then we're talking about 
you know, ultimately trillions of dollars of, of notional exposures being managed and moving around, not necessarily sloshing around, but, you know, with the potential to slosh around, is more in this idea that certainly in the post-crisis world, desks, whether long short equities or a long only real money account or a relative value 10 times levered fixed income uh, ARB shop or a 20 times levered market neutral strategy, quant strategy, generally speaking, are all under a kind of a, a VAR constraint. That is the world of risk management in the post-crisis world, you know, specifically with the buy side as it relates to investor expectations for managing that risk. Investors and their consultants expect certain risk parameters met, certain kind of institutionalized risk management structures built. And the point is that volatility is the trigger. Volatility is the toggle by which positions are grown or reduced, and volatility is that tail that wags the dog. The other is that in the post-crisis period, banks, through regulatory oversight, now manage their risk very differently and have to manage their risk very actively, you know, on a kind of a, a daily dynamic fashion. And so CTAs are important because what they are is, is kind of picking up a very unemotional reversal of a trend. And when you get a reversal of a trend, and as I said, you know, these are the size of the positions are inversely proportional to the instrument's X anti volatility, that that is picking up a shift in positioning, a shift in volatility that then ripples out across all types of strategies that are not pure momentum. And the point is that everything, when you're allocated in this current real life 2019 into 2020 market structure, volatility is the toggle and everybody becomes a de facto momentum trader. So that's the thing. I mean, people have said, do you really think, you know, when you, when we nut one of these calls that, you know, at this level, the signal flips from long to short or, you know, something of the like, and, and that has happened a number of times over the past two years, you know, do you really think this is ticking the, the generalized CTA community and their behavior? And I think, look, there is something to it. Absolutely. I mean, we regress this to the index and it tracks, it replicates the benchmark index for years going back. We, we continue to track those cumulative returns. So we know we're doing it right. We regress it on a weekly basis to see where the slippage is and make the according changes on, on, on that basis. So it fits. You know, I also, too, though, think that because people know that they're so volatility sensitive, you know, and I'm talking about discretionary traders, fundamental traders, that there is an element of front running these levels. There is an element of self-fulfillment of these levels where people try to trade ahead of these of these levels of kind of a game of telephone of these levels that enhances the feedback loop, enhances the echo chamber. And I think that is also part of why the story has grown bigger than what I'm actually trying to capture, which is simply these critical reversal levels, these critical inflection levels that then start that larger snowballing across all strategies. Let's go ahead and move on to the signals that you're getting now and what you've written about equities, because it sounds like you think with a little bit of good news recently, maybe we're in kind of an overbought situation that makes us vulnerable to a reversal in equities. What are your models telling you? What do you see on the horizon? What are the numbers to watch for? So I think there's an interesting dynamic where, where you know, in this most recent kind of tactical view in the Wednesday note, where you know, I'm saying that the bond sell-off is tired, positioning has been cleansed. With that, with that, and, and there's there's no kind of next sell levels at this point because positions are established and the duration uh, position has been taken down. With that, a lot of these cross-asset momentum trades that have really accelerated, these momentum reversal trades that have accelerated the last two months are probably fatigued too. That thematically matters then at this point, if I think the bond sell-off is largely kind of washed for now, because you probably won't be seeing that cyclicals over defensives trade, that kind of old tech over new tech trade. You know, as I said, all the software names that were up 80% year to date have lost 20% you know, in a couple of weeks. You know, I think on the micro level, that's where it matters. I think, though, with regards to the macro story, the macro takes a little bit of a back seat here. And now, to me, the kind of the short term risk is purely just about positioning with regards to investors 
who have either um, you know uh, directly or kind of indirectly become very long equities over the course of this kind of recent rally escalation, which was generally attributed to positive news, right? Not as bad global growth data, a couple of nice U.S. data beats on top of this general positivity around China trade, right? So if I'm talking about very long equities, what am I talking about? Well, if you look at the net dollar absolute position in S&P futures for asset managers from the TFF data, we're looking at a 98 and a half percentile position dating back to 2006. I mean, very long equities in that sense from real money. If I'm talking about our CTA models estimated positions, we're now back to plus 100% long signal in 12 of the 13 global equities futures that we track, you know, versus a month ago where a number of those had deleveraged and a couple of them were even flipped short. And then specifically, and this is one near and dear to my heart, because again, I look at the world through this volatility lens, through this fall lens. If I look at S&P index options, if I look at SPY ETF options and, and look at their consolidated Greeks, we see that the net long dollar delta is 98th percentile since 2013, which means that, you know, frankly, you have a market that protected themselves on an upside rip via options, right? They don't have the big net exposures right now. They're generally speaking, and that's why the momentum unwind has been so profound, you know, the momentum factor down 15% in two months, they've been in the more bond sensitive stuff and have been short the high beta stuff. So they haven't performed the same way that the market has to the upside. So they've kind of slacked on positioning into this rally. They've slacked on performance into this rally, which has made it a not feel so good rally. They're not, you know, losing money, but they're not capturing the actual extent of the move. So what now that means is that, you know, through all this options upside exposure to to kind of hedge themselves on a melt up, they are now long what I call like soft delta. Right? They're not long in their underlying single stock names. And they're probably, when you get 98th percentile plus type of options positioning, options dollar delta, they're more prone to begin to take profits. They're very long. The market has moved up significantly. Now it makes sense to monetize them and stuff, especially just if you're looking at where we stand over the course of the year and the fact that they haven't performed quite as well as the index has over the last two months. So I, I ran a really interesting study last week, and I think it's it's important to talk about. You know, I just talked about 98th percentile net dollar delta across S&P and SPY equity options positioning. Again, it's kind of this length that has been added via those option structures, via the upside strikes. Well, if you test a 98th percentile dollar delta in conjunction with basically a 95th percentile, let's say, dollar gamma position, and that is a, a net dollar gamma position, I'm actually capturing in the dollar gamma position the fact that the market is ground and made this power move grinding higher to such an extent that overriders, right, sellers of volatility, are now you know short a fair bit of optionality, and they have dealers very long gamma. Right now, that's the reason that we're stuck at this 3,100 level. There's $16 billion of dollar gamma at the 3,100 strike. That is just a massive number. I actually can't think back off the top of my head the last time we had an absolute dollar gamma at one strike of, the, of that size. That's why we're kind of stuck here. But the interesting thing about this analog, this back test that I ran, is that when you look at that extreme dollar delta and that extreme dollar gamma in conjunction, you actually show potential for kind of near to medium term equities downside and really significant VIX upside over kind of the, the you know next X number of months. So what does that actually you know look like for S P? It looks like, you know, over the next two weeks you see a pause to a pullback, you know, down let's say 30 bips over the next two weeks median return. Over six months, that looks like an almost down four percent median return. But really, where you see it is in the VIX complex. The median return over you know a number of these samples that that we've tracked you know previously a 55% VIX return over a three month window. So that iterates to me that this positioning has overshot a little. And now, if you do get a scenario where 
look, the market has really baked in a significant amount of positivity with regards to these phase one talks, right? And if you, you look at you know Donald Trump's speech to the economic club yesterday, and a market that you know I think was telling us that people wanted to kind of short that mid-December kind of finger in the air phase one deal signing, because everybody knows that the phase two is the hard part that we'll probably never get to, that now you're probably further incentivized to take profits because he didn't back down on tariffs, right? He and and now they've adjusted, you know, himself and Cudlow over the last few days, kind of backing away from a hard date on signing. It feels like the easy money has been made there. And if you're long all this market upside via options in your kind of soft delta, I'm going to start taking some of that off. If I'm an asset manager, you know, and, and collectively that universe is is 98th percentile along the uh, S&P futures, you know, $130 billion of length, I'm going to start taking some of that off. So to me, it's about this positioning and now this kind of macro like, oh, wow, we priced in best case all of a sudden on this China trade stuff. It maybe is a little murkier than we thought. I'm probably going to take some of that off. And why you do tend to see this kind of two-week, one-month window for a pullback when you look at some of these analogs of the options positioning. Charlie, I want to stay on this topic of volatility and, and the VIX in particular. As you remember, about 18 months ago, there was this widely reported just blow up of the vol complex after a whole bunch of retail traders who literally had no idea what they were doing were all short the VIX. Now, there's an old saying that the hardest learned lessons are the longest remembered. But it seems like that may not be the case here because some analysts that I've been reading are saying that the COT reports are now suggesting that they're at it again, that that we've got that record speculative level of short interest in the VIX futures contract, people trying to pick up that contango yield that sets them up for that same kind of blow-up risk that happened at the beginning of 2018. Now, you just said a few minutes ago, you see significant upside potential in VIX. That could be the next blow-up event. So is it accurate to say that they're at it again, or is the picture maybe a little bit more complicated than that? No, it's, it's, a, it's a great capture of, of the dynamic, Eric. I mean, I think the, the challenge is this, and I, I know we've spoken about this previously, the dynamic of February 2018 will never be seen again. And, you know, and I don't like saying this, but, you know, unless a bomb goes off in the middle of downtown Manhattan in in the middle of a trading day, you know, point being that we will never see that amount of short vol need to be rebalanced at the end of the day. And why is that? Because February of 2018 was the extinction event of the leveraged short vol complex. Those products don't exist anymore. And that just created an impossible amount of rebalancing into a tiny window at the end of the day where, you know, God forbid you had this kind of filing, right? Filing meaning, you know, a bankruptcy event for some of these, for some of these products where there was a macro catalyst over the month of that prior January, where all of a sudden inflation became a thing and the market had to suddenly shock adjust to the possibility of a Fed power tightening, which is exactly what happened over the course of last year. Now the, the, the reality is this. Those products are gone. And if those products are gone, we can never have that kind of squeeze. More importantly, I think right now you're seeing this, you're seeing this discussion where you know, people are taking in isolation a snapshot of the CFTC non-com, meaning spec, spec position in, in VIX futures. And they're hyperventilating on the fact that you know, the net position is the most short it's ever been. You know, the trick to me is this. A lot of folks don't realize that the VIX ETN complex on the other side actually more than offsets that short Vega position in the CFTC futures because it is the other side of the trade, right? So the short-term VIX ETNs, which if you backtest this type of extreme long that they have, which again, more than offsets the, the net Vega short in the non-com futures position, the ETNs tend to have kind of the near-term forward returns right, like they're long vol, and you actually tend to see higher kind of near-term volatility when you see this type of extreme. Right now, the net vega position for ETNs is 99.7 percentile since 2011, right? 
if you look at that non-com spec hedge fund VIX futures net Vega position, yes, it is extreme. It's 0.2 percentile since 2011. But again, the point is there's the other side of that trade, and it's the VIX ETNs, which to me, a lot of people aren't you know advertising the full story here. So that's why you know I appreciate the opportunity to to clarify it. I am of the view that equities are going to pull back in the next two weeks to one month. Might be down two, might be down five percent because of this extreme positioning. And yes, VIX is is low on an absolute level, let's say, kind of like a 13 handle in the in the index, not necessarily front month uh, future. But one other point that I'd like to make on the non-com VIX futures position is that it's so short right now because systematic roll down players who play the shape of the VIX curve are massively into that trade because of the shape of the curve right now. The curve is so steep. And that is part of what's happening right now is they get a signal due to the steepness of the curve, right? Where front month vol has been smashed, partially because the VIX ETNs just had to rebalance. And for seven months in a row, when VIX ETNs rebalance, you've seen the VIX trade down multiple vol points the one week into the event. They have to sell the front month to buy the second month. That is an inherent steepener of the VIX curve. That is then a signal for systematic VIX roll down guys to come in and try to trade the shape of the curve with such a steep roll down. And to me, they actually end up kind of getting run over on this trade. Why I think there is VIX upside, you know, in this next kind of two weeks to one month, I think that kind of that type of uh, roll down that systematic roll down, they hedge kind of uh, indiscriminately in some ways. So I think that's a big story to me, but you can't talk about vol without really going into you know, the larger offsetting other side from the VIX ETNs. Finally, I want to move on to gold, a subject that we haven't talked about since the breakout occurred that surprised a lot of people, myself included, past 1350, which had been a key resistance level for almost five years. First of all, how do you interpret that? A lot of people think, okay, this is a clear signal that we're now in a new secular gold bull market. Uh, Do you agree with that? And if so, does that mean it's time to buy or does that mean it's time to wait for a more significant pullback before getting back in? So to me, gold gold is a shapeshifter. Gold at times, and I think a lot of people probably incorrectly associate it with some sort of a risk-off hedge in and of itself, which is not always the case, because other times gold acts like an emerging market's risk currency. To me, the story of gold over, you know, this past year rally kind of story, and we started getting pretty bullish on gold uh, late December last year, was core to my steepener thesis. My steepener thesis was that front-end yields were going to probably be collapsing as the market sniffed the slowdown, forced the Fed into a much more aggressive, a much more aggressive easing cycle than many people uh, believed was possible. So, you know, the trick then to me is that gold began to trade off of lower real yields. It began to move higher, opposite correlated, right? So indirectly correlated to lower real yields. Now I think that markets have seen this dynamic where you're instead looking at a normalization of yields over the last two months, gold has given back, right? Yields, you know, it wasn't this end of day scenario. It wasn't this imminent recession scenario. So with that, you know, I think that was pretty important because you ended up seeing, you ended up seeing gold get, you know, pretty hard hit. And actually it's funny. So like a week ago on the day, on the fifth, where you had a huge purge, our CTA model had a, had the gold position reducing from 100% to 38%. And that still is where we sit right now. We had been pretty much over the course of the year long, 100% long in the in the trend signal. That has now been reduced on account of, you know, come from a macro indicator, the fact that real yield stopped going lower and frankly, you know, began going higher again. So I think now the trick is that my view here going forward is that the bond rally can actually continue. We've washed out that excess positioning, right? We had that big 40 plus basis point sell off in 10 years. I think now that as we pivot towards a more likely 
kind of deterioration in the China trade story again, as we kind of look past this phase one and into the tougher phase two, that bonds can rally again. And bonds rallying again means lower real yields, means higher gold. So it may be that right now is the time to be getting into that long gold position as we see what looks like maybe a reversal point in the bond market, which you think is probably the, the driving factor here. Yeah, yeah. I think that bonds have scope to uh, to rally again here. You know, especially as as it's tied into the potential for, you know, stocks to pull back. And with that, lower real yields should mean higher gold. Well, Charlie, I can't thank you enough for another fantastic interview. You write an absolutely terrific daily note, and uh, it's only available to institutional listeners who have a business relationship with Nomura. And folks, please understand, Charlie's not trying to be a jerk. His hands are tied. There are regulatory issues here, so he can't send it out to our retail audience. But for the benefit of our institutional audience, people who do have an institutional relationship with Nomura, how do they get your daily note? Because it really is one of the best pieces of reading that comes across my desk every day. No, I appreciate those kind words, Eric. Thank you. So look, it's it's um, if you are an institutional trading partner uh, and client of Nomura Securities, you can you know, reach out to your salesperson, and that includes you know the internet side or the cash equity side of, of our business, and uh, reach out to your salesperson and um, you know a certain kind of revenue threshold expectations. We'd be more than happy to to add you to the dailies and and to have further dialogue from there. You know as it uh, as it relates to kind of the more tactical intraday conversations. Well, Charlie, we look forward to getting you back on in a few months for another update. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to get an update from Charlie. It's always great to hear, uh, you know, at the quant and institutional level, just some of the insights as to where we are on the markets. What did you take away from it? Well, I thought it was an excellent interview, and uh, I was particularly interested in Charlie's call that he thinks the backup in interest rates, the correction, if you will, in bond yields is ending and that we're headed toward lower yields. And it's got me thinking about gold price. You know, I've been holding out for 1420 to start really buying in size here. And actually, I bought just above 1450. Should I have bought more there? Uh, could it be that, that this was the bottom if interest rates are really going to turn around? here. So I think what we should do, Patrick, is dive into your chart book and go into a little bit more depth on our market wrap subjects. Listeners, you'll find the link to Patrick's chart book in your research roundup email. It says post game chart book. Patrick, let's dive right into the S&P 500. You've got the daily chart on page two, but it looks like you've added something new on page three. What's going on here? So on page three, since Charlie spends a lot of time talking about gamma exposures in the markets, I snagged off of uh, spotgamma.com's website just where we are on the gamma charts on the S&P 500. This is uh, for the SPX here. And uh, what we continue to see, and, and Charlie referenced it in the interview, is that there's this big, huge amount of gamma up at the 3100 strike on the S&P 500. And as this chart shows, that actually creates a low volatility hurdle that's like a wall that has actually been a major overhead resistance. Now, how much of that overhead resistance rolls off here in the November expiration coming up tomorrow is something I didn't calculate, but it is certainly has been the big hurdle for the markets. But uh, there's a couple other interesting observations I wanted to make on this chart, which is the high volatility zone where dealer gamma flips isn't until under 3,000 
on the S&P. So even if we were to have, like uh, Charlie, I remember him saying something around a, a 2 3% correction would not be out of line. I mean, if we had a 100 S&P point correction and went back down to like 3,000, it still wouldn't be enough to drive at least uh, aggressive dealer selling in the gamma flip. So with that in mind, I wanted to go to that chart of the S&P 500. And highlighted there in the 10 circled areas is the expirations of each option cycle for the 10 months of, uh, that have passed this year. And uh, what's an interesting characteristic that I've seen a number of people on Twitter point out is that we've seen a lot of times where the market will rally and get pinned into an expiration and that there's a tendency for the markets to step back pause and or correct in the post expiration cycle. And what we have here is a scenario that the only two times that we've seen where the market continued to rally right after the expiration was in January and this past October. And uh, with the market overextended and pinned right above 3100, I suspect that the market is uh, vulnerable here for at least a, a pause and or a market correction. But with that being said, I think that it would take a lot of damage for this to flip. In other words, we could easily get a pullback, retest what were the previous highs of the S&P you know, around that 3,020 level, find very legitimate support there, and that becomes a base for a continuation pattern higher. I marked off in the box there the Fibonacci retracement zones is sort of in the 2950 to, uh, to 3,000 area where there's a number of Fib retracement zones from the prior rally. And for me, in order for the bears to get any traction, we would need to see the price action legitimately starting to crack 3,000 to the downside. Then we start seeing you know, CTA flips and all sorts of things start to happen where selling could accelerate. So I'm, I, at this moment, I think the market is vulnerable for a step back, but I don't necessarily think it's the big one yet. It's, uh, we probably could see a 50 to 100 S&P point pullback here before we correct. What's your take on that? That sounds very consistent with what Charlie said. It sounds like he's expecting in the next couple of weeks that there is some kind of pullback and then maybe a rally after that into the end of the year. It sounds about right to me. My feeling in general, as I've said many times, is I think that the equity market is melting up. It's being driven higher by what I'll call unnatural forces. It's not that the economy is wonderful and you know there's going to be wonderful earnings that are going to support the higher share values. This has everything to do with the Fed being extremely accommodative and providing low interest rates, fueling corporate stock buybacks and allowing the market to continue to melt up. So uh, I, I think the idea of a pullback before year end, then a rally into year end, Christmas rally, certainly makes sense. I don't really have a strong directional view on the market, though. All right. Well, let's move on to page four, where I have a crude oil chart. And after hearing your market wrap, I kind of wish I added the 200-day moving average on here just so that we had a reference point. But I did draw a little line there where the, it's the 61.8 retracement of the uh, the sell-off that we had from that uh, Saudi attack in September to the bottom in October. And for me, while the crude oil, like you were saying, has been bid pretty consistently, we have a major hurdle that has to be beaten for the for the oil markets i think to t flip bullish because at this stage if we have a uh, crude oil fail at this level and for whatever reason a catalyst you know drives us down to 54 dollars or lower that really opens the window for another full measured move extension lower and while i'm not necessarily forecasting that i certainly uh, feel that the bulls better show up for the party and punch through some of these overhead resistance levels otherwise that bear scenario starts uh, becoming an, uh, a real possibility. What's your take on that? Patrick, I really have fairly low conviction about the direction of this market from here. And the reason is I feel two competing forces. One is it feels toppy here. It feels like we can't seem to get through this key resistance level. We, we ought to head lower. If I just take a look at the chart there in this trading range that we've been in, another test down to, let's say, between 51 and $52. Seems like it could very easily be in the cards. Just visually looks like that maybe is what ought to happen next on this chart. The thing is, for the last couple of weeks, there's been this just really weird feeling in the market that every morning around 7.30, 8 o'clock Eastern time, 
just as the market looks like it's about to fall off a cliff, all of a sudden the buyers come out of nowhere. Sometimes there's news behind it and they buy more and faster than the news warrants. Sometimes there is no news and they just start buying because it's, you know, it's morning time in, in Eastern time zone. So it feels to me like either some big funds have taken a longer term view and have begun accumulating or somebody's doing more and more buying. And I think it's a question of, are those buyers going to get more aggressive? Are they willing to push the market through those levels in order to get it higher? Or are they real smart buyers who are going to say, hey, let's let's give it a little break now and let it drift back down to $51, $52. Feels to me like somebody is ready to do a whole bunch more buying. They certainly have been doing plenty of it, and they've been coming into the market at strange times. So it's a question of what they do next, and I'm not sure who that is that uh, that we're talking about. So I could see it go in either direction here. All right. Well, you know, I personally would love to see it break higher, <laughs> but let's <laughs> we'll see whether or not that uh, comes to fruition. Anyway, I want to I want to move on to page five, where I have a chart on gold, and uh, I felt uh, putting on a, a chart on gold and, and treasury bonds was warranted, considering Charlie had uh, such a well, he he shared a conviction that he thought both of them were poised to strengthen on the interim. So I wanted to kind of give us something to talk about, and while looking at the chart here, but to me, the interesting part about gold, irrespective of the fact that it broke to a, a sequence of lower lows for, from its high out in August, overall, the pullback has all of the same characteristics of a retracement or a, where a, a bull market advance usually tends to give back you know, anywhere from a third to half of its prior advance in a consolidation before resuming back in its bull market form. So for me, I, I'm, I still could see the scenario where gold is bullish. It'll be interesting. There's a, the consolidation that we saw in gold back in July. And that's around that 1420 area. And uh, w one of the more interesting things for me will be whether or not gold can stay decisively above that kind of 1420 to 1450 area, even if it tests into it temporarily. And if it nicely rolls up from there, that would be uh, uh, very bullish in the way the chart pattern will be developing if that kind of support line holds. Yeah, I'm hoping that we get there. I think that 1420 is a very attractive place to start buying in more significant size. I still think there's a good chance that we're going to get below 1400. But you know, 1420, 20 bucks is not not that much to ride down a little bit of a move, even if you've just bought a significant position. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, when we had uh, Alex Gurevich on, he was basically saying that like whatever, a 50 or $100 downside risk is peanuts versus the upside potential you have and that, that it doesn't matter if the, on the short term it's coming down here. This is an asymmetric level still to own gold. And so I guess we're splitting hairs in terms of whether or not there's another 20, 30 little dollar downdraft, right? Well, it could be considerably more than that. And I think it's really, it's a question of whether you're trading with leverage and how much dry powder you want to leave for the possibility of lower prices. You know, you hate to get into a situation where you spent your whole wad and you do get that break back down to 1350, which would be an extremely appealing technical level to buy. Probably not that likely that we'll get there. You don't want to get back to 1350 and be panicking and thinking about selling instead of buying more. You want to be buying more down there. So I want to leave at least uh, room to be buying more at 1350 if we get lucky and get that chance. Uh, I think 1420 is a good place to start buying in size, and I'm already accumulating small amounts on the way down. All right. Well, on, on page six, I just had the 10-year treasury chart on the bond futures. And uh, what a lot of technicians have been observing has been like a double top formation developing between the September, October tops and calling that this is the end of that 30, 40-year bond bull market. How many ends has top. this 30, 40-year bond bull market? Had. Oh, it, it's it's every 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 six months. There's a it's over, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, and uh, what's interesting is is that uh, whenever you have a topping formation, it obviously is again doing a retracing move. I feel that after a bond market rally of the magnitude we saw, it would actually be very natural for us to have a two to three month consolidation of the rally, backfilling and unwinding the very overbought state of the bond market. I'm with Charlie in the sense that I'm not remotely as bearish bonds. Now, I, 
I, I have not been in bonds for a couple months and maybe I should start considering getting back in. I took my profits on bonds all the way back in August a little bit too early. But, you know, the question for me is, is that is there a reason – this big bond bull market is over. I don't think I see it. I, I think that this is a, a market correction. And as soon as the market correction plays out, uh, I think there's room for this to go. Well, you got to think about Ray Dalio's comments. You know, is there a reason for this bond bull market to be over? Well, the reason for it to be over is because the market is sensing that the U.S. is not going to be able to finance its deficit spending, and we're going to get into a real fiscal crisis, and the Fed is not going to come to the rescue. Well, wait a minute. Why would the Fed not come to the rescue and allow everything to fall apart? Now, in the long run, I, I think the Fed coming to the rescue ultimately probably does more damage than it does good because it sets us up for an even worse fall later on. But that's not the way politics works. You know, the politicians want to solve the immediate threat right now, the one that affects them while they're in office. And they don't worry too much about what they're setting the next guy who's not coming into office for a few more years up with. So why would they allow interest rates to back up significantly so that it creates a financial crisis for the U.S. government being unable to unfund its deficits? Why would the Fed allow that to happen when they still have a printing press? Well, one reason is total runaway inflation. They don't have any choice. Well, we're not there yet. We're not anywhere close to that. I think it's coming someday, but it's just not rational to, to worry about runaway inflation right now. So why wouldn't they keep interest rates suppressed for a while longer? And that's, I think, the crux of Ray Dalio's argument. Someday they won't be able to. They'll be fighting impossible inflation, and, and they'll have to let Treasury rates get away. And it'll be a really scary situation for the U.S. government then. I don't think we're anywhere close to that. So I, I think that the outlook for continuing lower bond yields makes perfect sense. All right. Well, let's move on to chart seven, where I thought it was just an amazing chart, because what I did over here was just on a performance chart overlaid the performance of the TLT, which is the um, 20 plus year treasury bond ETF with gold. And uh, to me, it's, it's just uncanny how the correlation between the two is literally tick for tick. And I ask the question is, how long is this correlation going to stick? I mean, are we supposed to conclude that uh, we need a meaningful bond rally in order for gold to start the next bull phase, right? Like, uh, what's your thought on this chart? And uh, how do you think this will play out? Well, Patrick, as Charlie described in this interview and as Keith McCullough described a week earlier, the real correlation for gold is to real interest rates. That's interest rates adjusted for inflation. So I think the correlation that seems so strong between gold and TLT, where TLT is not inflation adjusted, is just because we've been in a pretty consistent condition of no particular monetary inflation in the system. This correlation, which appears to be tracking so perfectly here, is going to break down and stop tracking so perfectly when inflation really starts to take off, as Keith McCullough has predicted. But we're not seeing that yet. But Patrick, there's one thing that I do know with absolute certainty, which is that you are going to be in Vancouver on Saturday, November 30th, and Calgary on Sunday, December 1st, doing Options Education Day for the TSX Exchange. Give us a little bit of uh, background on what topics you'll be covering and tell our listeners how they can register if they want to attend those events in person. Well, Eric, I'm excited to be a part of the Options Education Day, which is being hosted on uh, Saturday, November 30th in Vancouver and on Sunday, December 1st in Calgary. And uh, I'm going to be speaking at the event uh, in the morning. I'm gonna, I have a topic talking about uh, using options to overcome fear and emotional obstacles. And then in the afternoon, I get to tackle the topic of understanding options pricing in the Greeks to optimize your trading narratives. And there I'm going to be touching on all sorts of uh, neat things like uh, the uh, Delta and gammas that uh, you heard uh, Charlie talking about. So anyone that would like to attend, you can click the link right in the chart book. There's also the link in the research roundup email or simply visit the Montreal Exchange website m-x.ca to register and uh, look forward to meeting many of our Macro Voice listeners out there. Thanks.
Sounds like a blast. I wish I could make it myself. Today's episode of Macro Voices was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. Be sure to check out my full-length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson, published on September 7th, 2019. The link is in your Research Roundup email. Now, if you don't have a Research Roundup email, that means you haven't registered your free account at MacroVoices.com yet. Shame on you. You can do that very easily for free. Only takes a couple of minutes. The benefit is you will receive our free research roundup email, which contains links to all of the best free research that we could find on the internet each week, including slide deck downloads for our feature interviews here on the Macro Voices podcast. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book for Charlie's presentation and charts that we discussed in the post game. There's also an article about why the repo markets went crazy and why December could be even worse. And also an interesting article asking the question, will China disrupt the monetary system with a cryptocurrency? So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend and myself at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>